Hello, I'm Mark Gans with the Department of Animal Sciences at Colorado State University. In today's brief audiovisual presentation, I want to discuss a little bit more about the inbreeding coefficient, or COI, and hopefully provide some information to better enhance the understanding of the inbreeding coefficient. So in this short audiovisual presentation, I'm going to go through two pedigree examples and also discuss the meaning of ultimately the number that goes with the inbreeding coefficient for each individual. And I've asked and, and been granted permission to use uh, several examples uh, from the Alpaca Owners Association of animals that are both inbred and not to illustrate the concept of the inbreeding coefficient. So these are used with permission. So, as we examine each of these, our first step in this process is to determine if an animal is inbred. And so I'm sticking with the use of these four generation pedigrees to evaluate whether an individual is inbred or not. And so this animal, Crea Peruvian Epiphany, okay, the first thing we look at when we decide if an animal is inbred or not, is to look at what we would say the top side and the bottom side. So essentially, we draw a line between the parent's pedigree, that is the sire's pedigree, and the dam's pedigree. Then at this stage, what we do is look to see if in that pedigree, any animals show up both on the top side of the pedigree, the sire side, or the bottom side of the pedigree, the dam side. If an animal in that ancestry shows up on both sides, the animal, Crea Peruvian Epiphany, is inbred. Okay, so let's go through that a bit more. So we draw a line, we look at the animals that are above that line in the pedigree and animals that are below that line in the pedigree and if there's an individual that shows up on both sides then this individual is indeed inbred if the answer is no the animal is not inbred okay now so in this case based on what we know about this animal's pedigree it's not an inbred individual but you have to remember and as you would get deeper into pedigrees okay if this represents four generations, so there could be per parental information on these individuals that is not represented on the four-generation pedigree, where an animal that is a parent of Peruvian Fuego G226, if we knew who those parents were, might show up here as well, indicating that this animal is inbred. Okay? But based on what we know, this individual is not inbred. However, let's look at the other one, and I'm going to shift a little bit our mode of presentation and go to a whiteboard. So here's the whiteboard. Okay, and so I'm pulling up one of the other individuals that we showed on a previous slide, Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR. And we're going to go through the same exact process to look at whether this, this individual has uh, an inbreeding coefficient greater than zero or not. Is this animal inbred or not? So using this pedigree, and I'm going to scroll it up a little bit so that we can take a look at the whole pedigree, we do the same type of thing. We draw a line between the top side and the bottom side of the pedigree, and we look for individuals that show up on both sides of the pedigree. Okay? And so we will check Tinker's Okoyo Dream Quest to see if that individual shows up in this region, the top side of the pedigree, and we'll check every individual. Well, if you take a moment and you examine this pedigree more closely, we'll see that over here we have Peruvian Oreo G236 as the sire of Ramses, and we also have that same individual as the sire of SMA luminosa. Okay, so we have that situation where an individual shows up on both the, what we would say is the top side of the pedigree and the bottom side of the pedigree, and therefore we know Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR is inbred. And we know that because 
we looked at the top side of the pedigree and the bottom side of the pedigree, and we found an individual that shows up on each side. So we know Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR is an inbred individual. And if we do the calculations, which are, are a bit beyond the scope of this audiovisual presentation, we find out that the coefficient of inbreeding for this individual is 0.78% which in the scheme of things is relatively minuscule, to be honest. Coefficients of inbreeding run from 0% to 100% in theory. The greatest animal as far as inbreeding that I know of in a livestock species, a production livestock species, not a research program, uh, was a little bit over 70%. Okay, so... 100% inbreeding probably means we have an animal that is not, does not survive, in all honesty. And so, let me illustrate why is this number important by going back to the whiteboard. So back at the whiteboard, with Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR, where we have established, after examining the pedigree, that there is an individual that shows up on both the top side and the bottom side of the pedigree, meaning it shows up in the sire's ancestry and in the dam's ancestry. And we've said that the coefficient of inbreeding for this animal is 0.78%. Okay, so really what does that mean? Hey, okay. so I'm going to use a hypothetical example. And please, I want to be very clear, it's a hypothetical example. Uh, associated with this animal, but it's not indicative of the animal in real life. But let's say there was a deleterious recessive mutation that occurred in Peruvio G236. So there was a mutation that's recessive, meaning it's not expressed, but if you had two copies of that and you were an individual, that mutation would be expressed. Okay, and so let's say this individual, we're going to use an example where we have a single locus, that's one location on an animal's genome, and we know that there are two alleles, one from its father and one from, or one from its sire and one from its dam, uh, two alleles at that single locus. Let's say one of those mutated, we had one copy of a normal allele and one that caused some genetic defect that was actually a mutation in this individual. Okay, so down here we have the same individual. What that 0.78% says is that there is a 0.78% that that allele could show up twice in Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR and be expressed. So what that's saying is that G236 passed that recessive allele on to Luminosa, who passed it on to Marabella, who passed it on to Tinker's Okoyo Dream Quest. And let's, let's assume this is the normal, the, the, the uppercase A is the normal form of the gene, but Tinker's Okoyo Dream Quest ends up with that genotype because this animal didn't have any defect or any mutation, right? So it was that allele. It had to pass on the big A. And then on the, on the top side of the pedigree, this defective allele got passed to Ramses, which got passed to Peruvian Fera, which got passed to Sierra Bonita's Peruvian Sniper. Okay, so now we have both the parents of Magnum of THR, Sniper's Magnum of THR, both the parents now carry this defective allele. And so what is the chance, because this mutation occurred out here in G236, that Sniper's Magnum of THR will get two copies of that and express that defect? Well, it's a 0.78% chance, which is very minuscule in the perspective of inbreeding. And so why is this relevant? Okay, so this, this same situation happened a number of years in one of the breed associations in another species we work with uh, in the late 90s, 
where a deleterious recessive mutation occurred in an individual. Nobody knew it. You would never know that uh, if, it, if it happened, except that a number of generations later, there was some inbreeding that went on, and offspring, not all offspring, but a small percentage started to show a certain defect with uh, uh, certain physiological characteristics. The animal was born dead. The offspring was born dead and had uh, exaggerated uh, uh, leg growth. Okay, it caused, uh, this defect caused that. And so at that stage, that recessive mutation that was present in the population became expressed because of inbreeding. And in this case, if this had happened with this pedigree, it would have been a relatively low, almost minuscule, less than 1% chance that Sniper's 44 Magnum of THR would express whatever that deleterious uh, defect might be. Okay, so why is this important? Is because that's a mutation that occurs that has a major effect on an animal if it's expressed. We know in an animal's genome there are many different locations on its genome uh, that might affect a trait, but affect it in a small way. And as that happens, those small effects on animal performance, whether it's infertility, where it typically is, or maybe survivability, or any of the fiber traits, we know that those, as those accumulate, they might have unfavorable performance for the trait. So typically we see this affecting fertility, the ability to produce a pregnancy, to deliver uh, uh, healthy offspring, and to do that on a, in a timely manner. That's one of the, the, the characteristics of in what we call inbreeding depression. So let's talk about that a moment a bit more. So what I just illustrated is what we call the expression of deleterious recessive alleles with major effects, where if a mutation occurred in that ancestor that we didn't know about, but if that mutation were expressed, would have a large effect on the animal, typically maybe uh, resulting in lowered survival or perhaps even death, that coefficient of inbreeding tells us what is the percent chance that the individual will express that allele because it had the same ancestor on both the top side and the bottom side of the pedigree. Now, this happens more at many loci. The mutation rate isn't more, but we see this also happen at many more loci, or potentially many more loci, each of which where loci is a location on animals' genome, may have a small effect on the animal's performance. And we call that inbreeding depression. Now, inbreeding depression is, is a dec decrease in performance of inbred animals. And we see that mostly happen in traits like fertility and survivability. In alpacas, most of your fiber characteristics are very heritable. And so uh, we would expect inbreeding depression to perhaps have an effect on those as inbreeding in a population or the inbreeding level of an animal is large okay or inbreeding in the population increases we'd expect to see this more uh, occur more this concept of inbreeding depression now that said some breeders use inbreeding as a tool because inbreeding increases homozygosity so if you can select out those recessive alleles and find the high-performing inbred individuals, right? That means they're going to pass on the same alleles to their next generation. And we actually see inbred individuals producing more homozygous offspring. And often you'll hear this term, that sire really stamps its progeny, meaning the, the progeny look very much like that individual. And at the genomic level, what this means, essentially, this idea of prepotency where highly inbred individuals can produce progeny who are very much uh, like the parent. Uh, think of it as this way, the, the, the sperm or the egg cells that they produce, highly inbred individuals, uh, may be more uniform in the genetics in those sperm and eggs than an animal that is not inbred. Unfortunately, there are some other factors that involve performance of those inbred individuals and in that they tend to be more sensitive to environmental differences and uh, environmental challenges. 
So hopefully this has helped your understanding of the inbreeding coefficient and its utility and what it means.